Hey, what's going on, everybody? I'm just your average, everyday Canadian nerd here to talk about... Oh, Tyler's gone. You know what that means. It's time for Corrections and Addendums, the episode where I talk about the things that you have commented on my videos that may correct something I have missaid or add information that I might not be aware of. And in the meantime, you can enjoy my Janie cat here on her nest while she does whatever she does. Now, of course, that will be covered up as we go through these corrections, addendums, comments section, basically. And boy, we have a lot of comments uh, that I have to go through today. So thank you very much for all your input. It's great to have all this extra information. So first, let's go over corrections about the flag. All right, so we have Glenn here letting us know that when he was young, thank you, Glenn, for responding, by the way, he voted for the flag that we have now. That's wonderful. A flag that's uh, uh, seen other nations respect us and a few that damn us, really. And I, I don't even know about these countries that damn us for our flag. So, Glenn, if you could, please tell us a little bit more about that in the comments. If I figure out how to pin comments, I will pin that one in honor of you. Thanks. Next, uh, we have Randy Thompson here saying that the white flag, the white part of our flag symbolizes peace, tranquility, and neutrality. Well, thank you. Um, I'm not sure where we get this information, and I'm not sure how accurate it is, but I'm glad that you heard it, and I believe you, so thank you very much. <laughs> John Matheson, according to Raven HHCA, Raven HHCA, Raven HHCA, <laughs> that John Matheson had something to do with the flag. Uh, and according to Wikipedia, Matheson was a leading member of the multi-party parliamentary committee whose mandate was to select a new flag design for Canada. He and Dr. George Stanley collaborated on the design, which was ultimately approved by Parliament and by Royal Proclamation, uh, adopted as the national flag of Canada as of the 15th of February, 1965. Matheson wrote a book, Canada's Flag, A Search for a Country, about the creation of the new flag. So, Raven, thank you very much for pointing that out. Peter Zimmer says trying to get the Conservatives, or being the Blue Party, to agree on anything related to a new flag was a nightmare, so when the Liberals finally pushed it through, it was all in the Liberal Party red color, devoid of any of the blue that had been included in other designs. Oh, Peter, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Now, P. Spence points out that in this part... Or the United Kingdom, whose flag symbolizes a union of the three flags for right. Scotland, England, and Wales. Which... Uh, that it was not Scotland, England, and Wales. It was Scotland, England, and the St. Patrick's Cross of Ireland, or Northern Ireland. And that Wales was playing truant. Well, thank you, Spence. That's good to add extra context. And Zimmer again, commenting that to Americans, the flag is a living, breathing entity, and Canadians love what our flag stands for, but also realize it's physically only a piece of cloth. Now, that brings me to another comment I have around here somewhere. Ah, here we go. Margaret James saying, Solemn pride in our flag is perfectly stated. When we pull out the flag, it means something special. And Americans have a weird relationship with their flag. She says, A co-worker brought in a cake to celebrate Canada Day and had little paper plates with the maple leaf printed on it. A visiting American was surprised that we didn't find it disrespectful to put a piece of cake on a picture of our flag. <laughs> what? Well, she asked him uh, what he felt about the image of Stars and Stripes being used for, like, bandanas and bikinis. And I'm looking forward to her sharing what that coworker might have said. Uh, because, yes, we, we will wipe our face with a napkin that has the Canadian flag on it. And we're okay with that. It's, like, not a big deal at all. So thank you, Margaret. And um, that brings me to the end of our flag comments so thank you everyone who wanted to comment about the flags now we've got some comments about tyler himself 
This one is a three-parter here, basically saying he's basically just found a niche to make money on uh, YouTube. He can't really learn about a country by reacting to stereotypes and memes, but he is picking up a little bit, which is better than most Americans. He also has other channels using other aliases, and we have more information on that in... in... this comment by Vaudre La Vallée that Tyler Bucket has an alias Tyler Rumpel. Uh, he does the British reactions. And here Zamrod says he still watches his videos and he had at least two other channels to react. One was for UK and the others for Sweden. Each of them he never refers to any of his other channels. Hmm, that's too bad. On each channel he just portrays portrays himself as a guy who's really passionate about learning about that country, but after a while realize it's just a persona he puts on, so people from that country will admire him for appreciating their country so much. You can tell he really isn't paying attention to a lot, because he's still learning about the three countries, and then he forgets what he sees when he watches the next day's video that says the same thing. Mm. Seen him learn what a toque is multiple times, and eventually, like the fourth time he gets it, might just be an act to be constantly surprised by the same thing, or that he just doesn't remember. Oh, that's too bad. And PV comments here that I should check out John F. American. He remembers what we learn in each video and will often refer back to other previous videos where he hears something for a second time or when he connects the dots between different events. He provides meaningful feedback and will provide Canadian-US comparisons, sometimes do Canadian music as well. And boy, we've got a lot of Canadian music. So PV, thank you for that recommendation. I'd say once I get up to about 250 subscribers, I might start doing some videos about John F. American. So thank you for that, and thank you for sharing this video on any social media platform you have, because I don't have any of them. And if you subscribe, that adds to the subscriber count, means more people are going to get to see me. If you like the video, like the video! <laughs> that way, it gets recommended to more people, and the more people get recommended, the more subscribers, the more subscribers, the more I will do, because I like people and I like that people like what I do and if you like what I do I'll do more that you like. I hope that made sense. Okay and back to Vaudre La Vallée who wanted to talk about the Speaker of the House and he had some good comments here but I was not able to find the second half after I took this shot so we're just gonna have to go with you can read what's on screen please pause and enjoy. I hope you paused and enjoyed. And Valdre Lavalle, thank you very much because, yeah, this is a great read. I just don't have the coffee in me yet to say all these words. <laughs> And moving on from Tyler, we're going to other videos that people want me to make. So, we've got PV saying to go check out John F. America's reactions to Canada. Oh, I just talked about that. Yeah, that'll be the 250 subscriber special. Thank you very much. And here we have Margaret James. Oh, she's great. Uh, letting us know that Tyler did a reaction about Terry Fox and that I should go and react to him learning about the Marathon of Hope. Yes! And also um, about 9-11 and what happened with, like, Nova Scotia. Uh, yes, I would like to do um, all of the Tyler reaction videos. I've just got this thing where I'm doing them in chronological order, and he's putting them out at a, such a rate that if I'm going to catch up, I have to do it at a faster rate, and I, I've... I've got things need done. I'm, I'm sorry, Margaret. I'm I'm doing my best here. Uh, and, uh, hey, we've got another comment. I just need to find it. And it's gone. <laughs> Great. Oh, hey, I found the second half to Vaudre La Vallée's 
and we'll go here so you can read the other half if you just pause right now and enjoy. Did you pause to read? I, I hope you did, and I hope you enjoyed it, because Vaudrey, thank you very much. I enjoyed. You rock. <laughs> Now, moving on, we're going about uh, responses to my government video. Well, the video about uh, Tyler learning about the Canadian government. Peter Zimmer points out the Canadians don't vote for the prime minister. The party in power elects its own leader, and we vote for our local representatives. And that is absolutely true. I'd just like to point out that in the last um, federal election... We were still voting for our local representatives, but if you listen to the people talking, they were talking about voting for Trudeau or voting for Jagmeet Singh, because, hey, it's it's about the, the prime minister at the end of the day, isn't it? Kathy James pointing out that it's good to be reminded how everything works, and it's embarrassing not to remember what we were taught in school. <laughs> yeah, so true. I mean, that was a long time ago, and some teachers didn't do a great job. Um, she learned some of the stuff from Wanda in Corner Gas <laughs> on the episode where there was an American visiting, and he knew more about the government than the locals. <laughs> Yeah, I love that our elections campaign is accomplished in a few weeks of busing the candidates and their teams across the country to schmooze with locals. Then we vote, and it's all over, but the crying... Oh, those notes were wrong. Um, anyway, if you don't know the song, check out the Ink Spots on whatever music platform you enjoy, because... The ink spots are great, even if every song starts the exact same way, which is part of the charm. Thank you, Kathy James. And next we have Oxford Boy CA. Excuse me, I need more or less coffee, apparently. Just to clarify what I was saying, that Tyler's interpretation of the Senate nomination process. The Prime Minister does not recommend for appointment all the seats of the Senate once he's elected. The only ones that are vacated by... Uh, oh, he only inputs the ones that are vacated by a retiring senator or one that reaches the age of 75. Yes. And... Many are not from political class. Many business, arts, and sciences. Their political affiliation is not always clear. And the Senate rarely reflects the House of Commons. Very true. Thank you, OxfordBoy.ca. OxfordBoy.ca, the C Canadian Oxford Boy. <laughs> I appreciate your input. And uh, then we're going to move on to the history of Canada. We have a few new comments there. Um, if I miss anything in this video, please refer to Corrections and Addendums, Episode 1. First, we have Kathy James who is thankful she's learning a lot about Canada that she didn't know, possibly due to the vastness of our country and big differences between cultures in the East and the West. Yeah, we're, we're a big country, and there's a lot of differences from one coast to the other and North versus South. It's is a lot of turf and it's there's a lot of differences <laughs> and uh she recently learned about the canadian hero general andrew george lotta mcnaughton who served his country diligently as a scientist inventor soldier and statesman for more than half a century she bought three volume set of john sweetnam's biography of mcnaughton at a public library discard sale his interest in science resulted in the invention of the cathode ray detection finder, the direct forerunner of the radar in 1923. Wonderful. He was born in Musiman, Saskatchewan in 1887 and served in both world wars, was greatly influential in important government appointments, had a controversial career, and is well deserving of great reverence for his part in Canadian history. But alas, we have never heard of him. Of course, he maintained quiet humility despite his accomplished career. He actually filed a patent for his work in radar detection, but it was overlooked and someone else got the patent. So, uh, McNaughton, good job. And that that's a Canadian hero right there. And we're moving on. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. 
<laughs> and here we have, whoa, Peter Zimmer uh, comment bombing me. Uh, most Canadians have no idea about the Governor General. We only hear about them if they spend too much on expensive biscuits on their government plane flights. Yeah, that's um, that's a throwback to American news, not American news, um, to, to news coverage from like a year or two ago and like decade ago and before. Um, he also says a lot of the pushback against the new Canadian flag was from veterans of World War One and Two who fought and died under a different flag. And that's fair. That makes sense. Thank you, Peter. The quiet revolution in Quebec against the Catholic Church would be akin to what happened in Ireland without the controlling RC Church. Remote control church? Ro Rosicrucian church? Hey, sorry, I'm not up on my Irish history, uh, but Peter, thank you for pointing that out. Actually, Canada did not become entirely independent until 1982 when Pierre Elliott Trudeau repatriated the Constitution from Britain. You know, I've heard that there are several different points in history where Canada became independent, and it happened here, it happened there, it happened here, it happened there, it happened there... It kind of all happened in a cloud, right? And we can pinpoint exact spots when things happened, but I think the agreement was that it was in the 60s where the, the ship actually turned around. Uh, and hey, he calls me Rasputin, so I must have been alive back then. I was just paying attention to, uh, what can I say, my own little life. Um, I, I was putting my pieces back together then, so thank you very much. And uh, Cabo uh, was actually an Italian exploring for England. So Jean Cabo was actually more of a Jean, Jean, Jean Cabot, Cabo with a silent T, Cabo. Isn't that what I said, Jean Cabo? It, it's hard to get pronunciation through writing, but Peter, thank you for your enthusiasm. I appreciate you. Here we have Patrice Bolvain saying the Basque did visit Newfoundland and up the St. Lawrence, but they were hunting whales for fat. A historian from the Museum of War in Ottawa wrote a number of books published by Osprey Publishing detailing the locations and info on French forts in the U.S. and Canada, even in Utah, if not mistaken, which was surprising. Well, thank you for your input. Uh, I don't think I actually talked about the Basque, and I appreciate you adding some extra context. So thank you, Patrice. And here we have Eric Lafontaine, who is saying again, uh, James Doohan served in the Second World War, not the First. Yes, there are other people who have commented that. Uh, please refer to the first corrections and addendums video where I pointed out that I made a mistake saying that. Yes, he he was born after the First World War had ended. So, my mistake, it comes from a long time of enjoying my life without much learning, if you understand what I'm showing you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> also, one of the many errors in the original video is that Asians, not Europeans, came from the Bering Land Bridge. Correct. It was a bridge connecting North America and Asia, and I'm not sure where the Europeans came in. So thank you, Eric Lafontaine, and please uh, refer to my first corrections video. Here we have Jim Davison, who huh, wanted to write a lot about Cabot, Cartier, Champlain, and other early explorers and settlements that the English and French settlements were often built reactionary to each other. As example, a uh, French fort Beau Séjour had an English fort built just across the valley floor, with both forts having a line of sight of each other. Larger, facts, uh, l larger forts being Halifax for the English and Louisbourg for the French, and this is the manner in which much of early Canada was developed. Very true. Something about ten-year-old brides commercial adventures, Louisiana was a French colony lost to the British on the Plains of Abraham, where French settlers lost most of their voice. Uh, 
roundup of French settlers in New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and PEI, sending them to Louisiana or back to France. The Acadians, many of them staying in Louisiana. That's where we get the word Cajun, Acadien, Cajun, Cajun. All right. Uh, horses taken from the French were stolen and sold very often, but a boatload ended up in Sable Island off Nova Scotia's coast, and their descendants are still wild there to this day. Very true. Protected status creatures. Yes, the Sable Island horses. They are a national treasure. Something else happened. Uh... All right. A uh, small but thriving PEI Acadian community at about 5,000-ish. So, Jim, thank you very much for your information on the Acadians. It's not something that me here in uh, southeastern Ontario gets a lot of information about. So, we appreciate you, Jim. Keep being awesome. And here, Peter Zimmer pointing out that the White House has always been painted white. It's just after the War of 1812, they had to slap on another coat of whitewash. Very correct. Thank you, Peter, for your information and input. All right, and here we have a lot of people that want to point out that Louis Pasteur was not Canadian, he was from France. And yes, absolutely correct. Why do I have it in my head that Louis Pasteur was Canadian? Because penicillin. Do, do I know why? No. Um, and it's a lot the same as... There's like three or four streets in this area where I live that start with the letter G. And I mix them all up consistently. It makes meeting people very difficult. And so it is with pasteurization and penicillin. So everybody pointing that out, thank you. You are correct. I am not. <laughs> And we have a lot of people also want to talk about the Plains of Abraham, such as Ate, you see, uh, who is your average Quebecois, reacting to your average Canadian, reacting to your average American, reacting to the mishmash history of Canada that omits many of its important parts, such as the mistreatment of the First Nations, omitting the fact that they were torturing each other well before our arrival. Read up about Jacques Cartier's first voyages and being asked to help attack the Iroquois, and then him and his men freaking out as his new first eight nations allies tortured the twelve captured Iroquois and force-fed them to each other. Ah, oh, c'est horrible, ça! Exemple numéro deux, the top government official Lord Durham literally calling for the cultural genocide of the French in official 1840 reports, laying out the policies that are currently being enacted in modern, softer days, such as Pierre Elliott Trudeau's choice of multiculturalism to genocide the French nationalism, as opposed to biculturalism that would have rightfully recognized both foundational nations, although I'd have preferred triculturalism. Note... Ate is 11th generation, with his ancestors being among the first 4,000 European immigrants back in the 1960s. Also, the tabernacle, no, the Catholic square words were well cemented prior to the 1960 Quiet Revolution. And the Canadian flag, like its anthem and maple syrup, are all from Quebec. Quebec was superiority right there. Uh, like the Idiot Justin Trudeau said Canada has no culture because the parts that aren't simply we are product brands and we aren't the USA are simply copied from Quebec, such as Putin being labeled as Canadian. All right, Ate. Also, how much a major fail the original history video is, not to mention the most important event in Canadian history, the near splitting in half of it as a result in the near miss ref for yes, Quebec is important, Quebec is big, but Quebec is not the entier of Canada. Recognize, please, that there are more places in Canada, and I think we are all important. So please, Ate, being Quebecois, get out of Quebec once in a while, eh? And here we have Axerix, who wanted to say that... Yes, the Plains of Abraham battle, also known as the Seven Year War, uh, was in 19, 1759. 
lasted fifteen minutes. Uh, once both generals died, even though the English assault and encirclement of Quebec City lasted for months. And here, yeah, it's the prelude to the end of the Seven Year War in Europe and the French and Indian War in the USA. And the Versailles Treaty in 1763 and Act of Quebec in 1774 ended the Occidental War between French and English and their allies two years before U.S. independence. North America is shaped by the result of the Battle of the Plains d'Abraham. Yes, thank you. Um, tellement correct. Uh, vous avez raison. Et uh, oui, comme Québécois, vous savez plus à propos de ça que nous ici en Ontario. Merci. All right, so that's all the focused comments I wanted to uh, touch on. And now we'll go to more of the scattershot comments that I've seen here, such as Sharon Mooney, who wanted to point out there are French in Manitoba as well. And yes, there are French throughout Canada in little pockets here and there. I think it's pretty interesting. Thank you, Sharon. Ate here saying some more. Nope, nope, I already did that. Okay, moving on, we have Jacqueline M. Hanson, who points out that we don't have Hulu, which is the only thing she has found. And uh, I'm, I think there are some other streaming services, but does it matter? Because we get to see what we want, where, where we look. Uh, what color was the White House before we burned it? Apparently it was white. I was wrong. Minnesotans come from Texas, then Canadians just talk too fast. All right. Life in Louisiana in July is lovely, too, and air conditioning is too cold. Would rather wake up in December in Canada than air conditioning all day in America. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's fair. But honestly, I'd rather wake up um, in the Arizona desert any time of year than somewhere in Canada, except then I'd have to deal with American people, which can be great, but can also be really scary with all the pew pew content and all the, um, the rioting stuff that happened over the past few years. <sighs> and French are also in Alberta. Yes, they are everywhere. Thank you for your input, Jacqueline. I appreciate your viewership and uh, sticking with me throughout all of this. Jacqueline, vous êtes excellente. Moi, merci. You rock. Keep being awesome. And moving on, we have Mati Bruno Lucas Sener Salas. <laughs> who is not the only one who wanted to point out that je me souviens just means I remember, and that's it. Uh, so who else said that? Goldo27. Yeah, just simply I remember. And that its real origin is something even the Québécois forget. Yeah, that's why I've been having a hard time getting a solid answer out of anyone I ask about it. It's not about the Quiet Revolution, but way before, to say that we remember where we come from. A mix of Aboriginal, French, and English. Not as a country of origin, but the mix of the people building it. Uh, now it's used to talk of the differences with the rest of Canada, like separation, the origins of those words are supposed to unite and talk what unites us. And yeah, I think um, that message of what we are together is the better message. But I specifically wanted to address what Mati Bruno Lucas and El Salas had to say. Okay, so bear with me here. Je me souviens. Okay. Aussi, il y a « je souviens ». Aussi, « je le souviens ».« Je vous souviens ». OK? Maintenant, on a ces mots en milieu. OK? Et ça change la définition. OK, OK. Alors, c'est quoi la différence entre « je souviens » et « je me souviens » Le mot « me ». OK? Maintenant, « je souviens » means « I remember ». Je me souviens means I, me, remember. Direct translation, right? Now, if we take out the word me and we put in the word le, it means I remember it or I it remember. Okay? Alors, le mot en milieu, c'est important, non? I see, oui. Je me souviens, c'est pas la même chose que je souviens, hein? Okay. Alors, si on pense à ça, juste un petit peu, on voit que je me souviens. 
veut dire pas I remember. Ça veut dire I remember me. Which goes to this comment here, which says, I remember where I come from. Je me souviens. OK. Ça fait du sens. Alors, Mathieu Bruno, le, Lucas Zener Salas, merci beaucoup pour votre information. Mais honnêtement, je me souviens et je souviens sont des phrases différentes. Pense-le, OK? But thank you very much. I appreciate you. And uh, I hope that you have a wonderful today. Whatever that today looks like, even if it's not today. Next, we have Michael Mardling, who wanted to point out that uh, the, the Buffalo Bruins are not, in fact, a hockey team. Correct. And I think if you uh, continue to watch that um, differences or stereotypes video, I can't remember which one it was, but I point out that I'm not into sports. So yeah, there's the Boston Bruins and there's the Buffalo Sabres. Which one was I talking about? Yes. <laughs> No, it was about the Bruins in Ottawa, because they always seem to have a rivalry when I was living in Ottawa. I'm not sure why. Uh, and so, thank you for being a sports fan. Uh, Michael, I, I appreciate you. And so does my cat, apparently. <laughs> And uh, here we have Jacqueline again saying that in Alberta, they sometimes call beer Wobbly Pop. That's great. Thank you. Uh, yes, I've heard it called Wobbly Pop, Bubbly Pop, and other forms of pop. So that, that's good to know. Thanks. In Alberta, they have Wobbly. And maple syrup costs close to $15 before inflation. Yeah. That's, um, that's true. And I don't know why, but I, I suspect it's because it has health benefits over sugar and honey, so the price will just keep going up. And I suspect it might have something to do with uh, how the weather's been getting warmer every decade. If there's anyone uh, who works at or lives near a sugar bush, maybe you can help explain uh, why the maple syrup prices have been going up. Uh, please leave your comments down below and I will address it in an upcoming video. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Also, you, she didn't realize, like many Canadians, that there's a difference in the cheese and the sauce between poutine and fries, cheese, and gravy. Yeah, so to make it a poutine, you need to have the cheese curds, okay, and they have to be the squeaky ones, and poutine sauce typically has a reddish hue from tomato sauce being added in the recipe. Uh, it's also different from gravy, as a gravy base is made using a roux, and uh, putin sauce is usually cornstarch to thicken it up. Now, that's not particularly necessary, but it does make a textural difference, helps it stick to the cheese and kind of soften it, because... It is the biggest shame when you get a put-in where the gravy wasn't hot enough to warm up the cheese. <sighs> okay, I'm gonna go make some put-in sauce, and I, th I think I might video capture it. But first, I have a few other videos about my cooking that I have to produce, and they take a while. I'm working on it, so thank you. Please stay with the channel for more. Next, we have Sylvana Dill, who had a lot to say on many videos. I just want to point out this comment saying that the ROM pales in comparison to many of the museums south of the border. And that's fair. There's a lot of museums across North America, and I've loved a lot of them. I've been to a lot of them. And I gotta say, ROM is bigger than a lot of them and smaller than a lot of them. Uh, and here we can see that Michael James Stewart just wants to point out a few of those museums in Toronto alone, uh, because he's reacting to my things to do in Toronto video. Whew, this is a lot to say here. 
looks like it was a copy paste from Wikipedia, but Michael James Stewart is a bit of a historian, so a lot to read here. I just want to focus on Toronto being blessed with 46 main museums, including, and not limited to, the ROM, the Design Exchange, the Hockey Hall of Fame, the Ontario Science Centre, that one's really cool, uh, the Gardner Ceramic Museum, Bata Shoe Museum, yes! a shoe museum and that's been around a long time if you're into shoes and i don't understand why but lots of people are from like stylish shoes to runners to sneakers to designer shoes you should check out the bata shoe museum it's probably interesting i can't tell you more the textile museum of canada the 48th highlanders museum oh that's a good one the aga khan museum the canadian language museum mackenzie house montgomery's inn and more and more the world-renowned art gallery of ontario the mcmichael canadian art collection which includes over 7,000 artworks by Tom Thompson of the Group of Seven, the Contemporaries, and the First Nation and Métis, as well as dozens of art galleries for all art lovers. Special fort should be, or special attention should be paid to the original Fort York, the fantastic Black Creek Pioneer Village. Yes, absolutely. The incredible Casa Loma, featured in the video, and numerous historical buildings. Not to be left out is the CN Tower Skywalk, yes, which is also mentioned in the video. I wonder how many people comment before getting to the end of the video. Hey, leave a comment if you got to the end of the video. Something like, I made it to the end, because that makes it clear to me that people are actually watching all the way to the end, and yes, this is the end of the comment section video. Thank you very much for all of your input, everybody. I look forward to reading everything that you write down. I look forward to seeing you all in the comments, all of you in the subscribers, all of you in the likes, and all of you in the future as I continue to produce videos for my enjoyment, for your education, for us, and for everyone. So thank you for joining me once again. I appreciate you. I hope you appreciate this, and I hope y'all just keep being awesome. <laughs> Bye. Science. Spirit. Life. Nerd Pulpkin.